Good evening and welcome to Primetime Lawmakers for March 21st, 2011, the 31st legislative day of the 2011 session of the Georgia General Assembly. I'm Scott Slade. Coming up in tonight's program, the House passes a resolution reinstating a pay boost for teachers who are national board certified, but they may have to wait a while to get it. Concern over states' rights leads to the defeat of a resolution urging Congress to update the federal Toxic Substances Control Act. We continue our leadership interview series and tonight in Wandy Lawson asked Department of Juvenile Justice Commissioner Amy Howell about juvenile justice reform and Georgia is among the top 10 states of the nation for home foreclosures. We'll go in depth in foreclosures with Representative Billy Mitchell of Stone Mountain, sponsor of a bill for greater borrower protection. All that and more is coming up tonight on Primetime Lawmakers. But first, the House agrees that the state should live up to its promise to give highly trained teachers higher salaries when the state has more money. Imwandi Lawson joins us live for the state capitol with news of the day's events under the Gold Dome. Good evening, Imwandi. Good evening, Scott. Passage today in the House of House Resolution 240 48, commending national board certification program for teachers, but stopping short of agreeing to give board certified teachers the 10% salary bonus they've received in past years. Representative Earl Earhart explained that the incentive program has been eliminated, but that the General Assembly could agree to offer the money to teachers who were certified before 2009. This isn't sending in your box tops and you receive a certificate. Uh, for doing it. This is a three-year program. It's very detailed. It's very difficult. And these teachers work very hard. Some of the best teachers in this nation are National Board certified teachers. All we're saying with this is that funds available when things get better, that we will express our intent to fully fund that promise that we made those years ago. More than 2,000 Georgia teachers are National Board certified. The House approved H.R. 248 by a vote of 163 to 2, which sends that measure to the Senate. A measure urging Congress to update the Toxic Substances Control Act, however, met a less friendly end today in the House, where H.R. 381 was defeated. Representative Doug McKillop explained that the Georgia Chemistry Council had requested the measure to assist chemical companies. Without uh, the federal government's uh, sort of saying these are the things we say are safe, these are how we want you to use them, then the individual states will begin to make different laws and it will hinder the chemistry council's ability to have its manufacturers and suppliers of chemicals have that business across state lines. And so yes, it does do that, but the, the, reason, for it, the reason for it is to encourage business across state lines. Does the gentleman yield? Yes. Is it a good idea for the state to give up anything to the federal government? Generally, no, but in this circumstance, since they've already done it and they've preempted many state regulations on these issues, it's a good idea for them to go ahead and uh, finish the job. They need to update this because it's 36 years later. H.R. 381 was defeated by the House. That vote was 80 to 86. Over on the Senate side of the Capitol today, House Bill 80 was voted down with senators disagreeing about whether local governments should continue to annex islands the way they have for the past two decades. These islands were created over 20 years ago. 20 years should be plenty of time for a city to decide whether or not they need this property annexed into their cities. A lot of these properties were surrounded uh, because of various reasons over the years, this provision will give the owners control back to he or she who pays the taxes on it. It seems like after 20 years of having this on the books, somebody somewhere has an interest that they want to protect. And I think that when we have this kind of thing, that we need to be very cautious because we have not heard any outcry from cities or, or local people to say that this is something that we need to address ourselves to. HB 80 was defeated by the Senate. That vote was 12 to 37. The bill will get another chance tomorrow when the Senate reconsiders its action. Meanwhile, a House bill that would change the way private citizens are deputized to serve civil warrants is drawing fire from the state's Sheriff's Association. And this prompted one of the sponsors of HB 284 to shoot back on a point of personal privilege this afternoon. But even though that we did all the things that we said we would do, they took the position, as you read in the, in the memorandum, by exercising what was intended to be a way that they could control if they were unhappy with someone who was doing the work in their county of being able to stop that person. And they did so with a blanket denial of having anybody and even tell them don't waste your time and money to go through the process of being uh, certified as a process server. 
I did speak with Terry Norris, he's the executive director of the Georgia Sheriff's Association this afternoon, and he told me that the organization does not oppose the use of private servers, but for public safety reasons, the sheriffs should certify them and counties should be allowed to opt out of that certification process. Now we look back at some matters that were being debated after our airtime on Crossover Day. The House agreed that evening to unite with neighboring states to urge Congress to return health care oversight to the states, but opponents of HB 461 say it's an end run around the federal health care reform. This House bill constitutionally allows us to reassert our power as a state and claim oversight and direction on a part of our government that is near and dear to all of us, health care. This bill will create an interstate compact, a simple agreement among states. This bill has nothing to do with health care and everything to do with politics. It's part of a national campaign to derail health reform for partisan and ideological purposes. Here's how I know. The leader of the national movement told me so. Let me give you another quote. The health care compact is a governance reform, not health care reform. Those words were spoken by Eric O'Keefe, who is the chairman of Health Care Compact Alliance, the group that is leading the charge around the nation on these very same compacts. Now, HB 461 was approved by a vote of 108 to 63. Should it become law, that plan would require federal approval. The House also agreed to extend a jet fuel tax exemption to Delta Airlines for another two years, and this drew the ire of the Clayton County delegation, whose members say the tax break takes millions out of county coffers. Clayton County schools have to cut $34 million from its 2012 budget in order to make ends meet. Now, I have no problems, as others have said, with Delta Airlines. I fly Delta. I have my Sky Miles. My husband flies. We love Delta. But at some point, we must stop the welfare to multi-billion dollar companies that can take care of themselves. HB 322 passed by a vote of 113 to 61 and moved to the Senate. Today I asked House Majority Leader Larry O'Neill about the Clayton County concerns. He said he sympathizes with the county's economic challenges, but that they are offset by Delta's economic impact. I will tell you this, if Clayton County is the least bit unhappy with uh, contributing their splossed penny to, to keeping Delta Airlines headquartered here in my county will take them and we'll pay twice what they're losing for the next 10 years and we'll take Delta into our, our county. I don't know of a single asset. It's number one is Georgia's single largest private employer and plus all of the antecedent fuel taxes and, and other property taxes that are generated. Clayton County will receive about 70 million dollars by having the airport there, various different taxes, because all their property is in Clayton County. So you've got all that ad valorem tax. Delta does pay the SPLOS tax to, East SPLOS, excuse me, to Clayton County, and the loss to Clayton County. So they're getting those 2% as it is, which are, I think it's either 14 or 17 million a year is what that's generating, just because that airport's there. I doubt Clayton County could make an argument that they're providing that much in services to the airport anyway. So instead of being all upset, I would think that they ought to be maybe less grateful, but they still ought to be very grateful that the Atlanta airport is in, is in their area. And you can see the rest of my interview with Representative O'Neill tomorrow night on Primetime Lawmakers. Now back to crossover day. The Senate agreed that enforcement of the state's abortion laws could be improved if women are allowed to sue their doctors for failing to comply with these laws. Here's Representative Barry Loudermilk on SB 210. All this bill does is it gives the woman who is a victim of an illegally performed abortion or abortion that was performed in violation of any of the laws that this body has passed in the, that passed through this and been signed into, the, into law, it gives her the right of legal standing. When it is not the woman who sought the abortion and who had the abortion that wants to bring charges against the doctor, but it could be an abusive husband or ex-husband, 
It could be an irate mother-in-law, et cetera, et cetera, on and on. It could be any one of a number of parties who choose to jump into this uh, legal procedure in a legal setting, legally consented to, and legally provided by a health care provider who's trained to provide this and who's licensed under the laws of Georgia. And we've created a whole new world of lawsuits. That's why I think it's not inaccurate to call this uh, a lawyer's dream. The Senate approved SB 210 on a party line vote of 36 to 16 and sent it to the House. The Senate did not agree to allowing harvest hunting on private preserves. However, SB 188 pitted hunt hunting enthusiasts against one another. Whether you are a hunter or not, help those of us and, and, and the boys and girls that are growing up and our kids and our grandkids and our great grandkids help preserve the heritage of hunting. This is not changing tradition. Right now in the state of Georgia, you already have the right to harvest these animals and these preserves. The only difference is the landowner cannot charge a fee. SB 188 failed by a vote of 20 to 30, rendering it dead for this year, unless it's amended to another piece of legislation. And over in the House, changing the rules of allowing hunters uh, to legally bait deer and feral hogs was more successful than that hunting measure in the Senate. Although HB 277 was aimed at South Georgia hunters, Representative David Knight argued that by giving oversight to the Department of Natural Resources, the rules could change statewide. I must tell you that some of the images in Representative Knight's presentation may be disturbing to some viewers. They say, oh, this will get the children in it. You know, my dad didn't bring me up shooting over a bait, teaching me how to bait. And before y'all take a final vote, I want y'all to go back and explain to your voters in your district, okay? Do you support this? Look at the corner in the bottom right corner. Do you support it? You better be able to go back to your constituents and tell them why you support shooting a deer over corn. I killed the first deer this year since 1999. It's not about slaughter, it's about managing. I managed the deer herd. It's on the place. We take does, we take the inferior bucks. I've got food plots at every single stand that I've got. I've got feeders out right now with protein and feed that I keep out year round. There again, we're not talking about moving the feed or baiting, we're talking about moving the individual because currently by Georgia law, you can already do it. And that was uh, Representative Jay Shaw presenting the bill, one of the sponsors. The House did approve HB 122 by a vote of 122 to 48 and sent it to the Senate. Reporting live from the Capitol, I'm in Wandy Lawson for Primetime Lawmakers. Wandy, one thing uh, you did mention from uh, the crossover day coverage was the legislation to overhaul the state tax code. Now, those bills have not yet been approved by the House, so where do they stand with crossover day behind us? Uh, that's a good question, actually, Scott. Those proposals from the Tax Reform Council came out of a joint House and Senate committee, so that legislation isn't governed by the same rules that most bills are. Those matters still have a chance of passage this year, but I did talk to uh, House Majority Leader Larry O'Neill this afternoon, and he said that although there is a need to change that tax code, he certainly favors a slower approach, and I'll have some more on that in tomorrow night's leadership segment. I will look forward to hearing that. Thanks very much, Amandi. Thank you. Have a good night. Now on to tonight's leadership segment, Iwandi began crossover day with Department of Juvenile Justice Commissioner Amy Howell as the House prepared to pass HB 265, creating a council to study how the state's prison population could be reduced. Iwandi asked the commissioner how DJJ fits into the governor's vision for criminal justice reform in Georgia. We have to think about what is the best setting for young offenders. Um, there's often a saying that's been said for adult offenders about not locking up the people that we're mad at, but the people we're scared of. And I think that holds very true for young people as well. Um, a lot of times we tend to detain young people that um, we've run out of options for or that parents have lost, you know, lost their patience with. Uh, and, and certainly I'm sympathetic to that. I'm a parent. These are, um, our young people are challenging. That's, that's why they're with us. Uh, the question that I pose to 
the juvenile justice community and the public at large is, is a detention, a secure, locked facility, the best environment for that type of young person. And I think this is similar to what the governor is trying to achieve. What continuum of services can we offer for the young people who perhaps are a risk to themselves, perhaps are not able to conform to the rules of their household, but aren't a risk to the community? Um, is that somewhere in between a secure environment and being back in the community? Perhaps for some of those youth, we need to reevaluate whether they can be successful in the community, but we need to provide some additional supports to them and their families. So the impact on our system um, is thinking about how we provide services and what the real level of need and risk is for the young people that we have, because as I've said, the population isn't shrinking and our resources are limited. So if we can place a child somewhere or a young person somewhere in the community or somewhere in intermediate, short of a locked secure environment, cost-wise, we're able to save money in that aspect. And I also want to point out that when we do place a kid in a secure environment, there's a, a risk there in terms of how far, much further into the system they're gonna go. And so I think that's a cost we need to weigh as well, that if we are able to provide supports in the community or in an, another environment, whether it's a, um, an evening reporting center or a group home or things we haven't done yet in Georgia, um, the cost not only in the immediate and what we expend on that, but also the long term is smaller. We also know that we have some kids that are a serious risk to public safety and, and those youth really do need to be in a secure environment. And my concern is that if we put all of the kids who are medium to low risk in those environments, we don't have space for those who really are at risk and need to be detained. One area that has been coming up quite a bit in the budget hearings is the closing of some of the youth detention centers around the state. I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit about that and also just what the overall impact of budget cuts has been on DJJ. We have two short-term facilities, RYDCs are what we call them, regional youth detention centers. Um, that are closing, one in Spalding County and one in Early County. They are two great facilities. They were 30-bed facilities. They were great staff. Um, we're not closing them because they weren't well run or they didn't help us. Um, they're great teams there. The challenge is the cost. A smaller facility has a greater cost to it. We did need to look at how we were spending our state budget money. Um, and trim back just like many other agencies. And so those are the two facilities that we identified based on utilization, um, based on population demand in the area. Um, and then also looking statewide. Uh, so the closure of those two facilities doesn't just impact those two counties, it is, does have a statewide impact. And so we did have to look at how best we could distribute our need and our services elsewhere in the state. In terms of the long-term impact, um, the number of kids that we are serving is not shrinking. So I have said during our budget hearings, we can manage these cuts for the next year um, and the cuts that we've sustained in the past. The question um, that I hold is, and that I have concerns about, is our abilities to sustain those types of cuts and how we've changed the system over a long-term period. And so now, uh, less than thinking about where these cuts are gonna impact us right now, I'm really looking towards the future and thinking about long-term, how we can best serve these young people, the community, and also keep in mind the demand for our services and, and where that is and where that places the agency. Talking to many of the other commissioners over the years, we've had to discuss the federal oversight of the Department of Juvenile Justice. Can you talk about some of the provisions that have kind of made the department more successful and able to come out from under that federal oversight? Part of what brought the Department of Justice to us is overcrowding. Overcrowding when you have too many young people and not enough staff and not enough space creates real safety risks. It um, really limits the ability of the system in terms of the services we provide. So part of what allowed us to get out from federal supervision was our excellent education system. We're SACS accredited. Um, we are doing the best we can and, and awarding diplomas and GEDs to young people who've dropped out of school, um, who've given up on schooling, um, that haven't been successful in the community in terms of education. So our education system is one that's allowed us to do that. Um, same thing in terms of medical and, and behavioral health. Um, we provide services to the young people who are in our system. We keep them safe. We have a level of staffing that's matched to the capacity that we have in those facilities. And that 
that those ratios are very important, not just for keeping the young people safe, but also my staff. And when we throw those ratios off and we don't have the proper supervision, um, any number of things that can happen that, uh, that unbalance the system and really increase the risk. And that was part of the reason for bringing justice in. So um, we've got a system now that works very well and um, we're proud of it. We're proud of the fact that when we do have incidents, we investigate them and we make sure that we're, we're also um, evaluating whether it's continuous improvement and auditing ourselves to make sure that we are not only doing well, but continuing to achieve our standards of excellence as we call them in continuous improvement. So those are all elements that um, have allowed our system to come out from federal supervision, but are also important in terms of the sustainability of our long-term success. Well, that sounds good. Amy Howell is the Commissioner of the Department of Juvenile Justice. We want to thank you for joining us here on Primetime Lawmakers. Thank you. Amy Howell is the previous Deputy Commissioner of the Department of Juvenile Justice. She's the first woman to head the agency. After this short break, we'll be back to talk about home foreclosures in Georgia and a bill that aims to help borrowers. This is something that affects thousands of Georgians. Don't want to miss it. Stay with us. Welcome back to Primetime Lawmakers. Georgia is often cited as a top state for home mortgage foreclosures. In February, Georgia ranked sixth in the nation, with one out of 317 homes receiving a foreclosure notice, according to the Realty Track data reported by the Associated Press. Legislation has been introduced this session that aims to help homeowners avoid foreclosure proceedings if possible. House Bill 419, a bill with bipartisan support as well as support for the banking industry for some provisions, will give borrowers the ability to stop foreclosure proceedings up to five days before foreclosure by payment of the past due balance of fees. Uh, the right to cure. Currently, the right to cure is not guaranteed by Georgia law. Banks may foreclose after one missed payment, although in practice this rarely happens. Joining me on set is the sponsor of HB 419, Representative Billy Mitchell of Stone Mountain. It's great to have you with us to talk about a real issue for our times here. Thank you, Scott. It's great to be with you. Maybe a thumbnail a sketch on why we uh, are in this uh, foreclosure mess in Georgia that we're in now. Why the high rate? Well, the fact of the matter is uh, it's no question that the, the downturn in the economy uh, has certainly contributed to a number of consumers not being able to fulfill their contractual obligations. Uh, certainly during the uptimes in the economy, perhaps we've even had some consumers that were, got into contractual obligations to purchase more home than uh, in hindsight they could afford. Uh, but the fact of the matter is we are where we are and uh, certainly if we're going to talk about uh, addressing our economy, rescuing our economy, we have to stabilize our housing market and we can't stabilize our housing market until we abate this foreclosure crisis. Foreclosure sales don't put many people to work, do they, in the construction industry? Certainly not. As a matter of fact, uh, w when we talk about the foreclosures, uh, we're not just talking about it injuring the consumer mm -hmm. whose house is getting foreclosed upon. We're talking about it hurts everyone. The fact of the matter is, even if you don't uh, have to be concerned about your house being in foreclosure, if your neighbor's house is in foreclosure, your house is worth less. Now talk about the protections mortgage borrowers have now under the law. Where, where are they? Well, the fact of the matter is in this state, uh, it, it, we have some of the most egregious uh, foreclosure law in the nation. I, I tell uh, a folk often that you can lose your home in this state if you are one day late. And when I say that, you know, uh, p consumer says, wait a minute, is that accurate? Well, we have a non-judicial process, meaning when you sign the myriad of documents at the closing, one of those documents is an agreement that the bank, the lender, the mortgagee can take your home without a 
judicial process. And in this state, you need permission from the lender to be able to pay your late payment or make up your fees. Uh, generally speaking, most of the banks will allow you to do that. But let me just to point out something very interesting, Scott. In Georgia, you have a $200,000 mortgage. You get in a bad situation, the bank takes your home, and let's say because of the depressed economy, the bank can only sell your home for $150,000. Hmm. They come after you for the additional, the additional $50,000. Oh, sure. Certainly. But let's take the same scenario. You've been in your home a long time, have a lot, lot of equity. Equity. Your house is worth three hundred thousand. You only owe two hundred thousand. The bank takes your home, sells your home for three hundred thousand. Guess what happens to the overage? They keep the overage, and therefore it creates an incentive uh, for some lenders to certainly foreclose on you. So this provides a much needed consumer protection. Well, talk about some of those protections. What's inside the bill? Some of the nuts and bolts that'll help people hang on to their homes, and I would assume keep the banks out of home ownership, they'd rather have performing loans, wouldn't they? Certainly, and I, and I think this helps the business community, certainly by keeping them out of the real, uh, real estate business, simply by allowing the consumer to have what we call a right to cure. No longer in, I, I don't believe in this country, and certainly not in Georgia, should a consumer who can, gets the money, whether it's through family, friends, they hit the lottery, or whatever reason that they can come up with all the back payments, the late fees and the attorney fees, uh, their, their loan should not be accelerated. If they could pay the entire balance of the loan, uh, they wouldn't be in a foreclosure uh, situation in any event. But certainly, if they can, in fact, pay all the late fees and get current, they should be allowed to, to certainly to keep the bank out of the real estate business. Now, will your bill give them more time to do that, to have this right to cure? Uh, certainly, uh, the, the, my bill provides that up until five days before the actual foreclosure, uh, the consumer will have the opportunity to cure their debt, and which is a good thing. Uh, the original provisions of my bill also called for a 90-day notice provision as opposed to at present in Georgia. We have a 30-day notice provision for the actual foreclosure. But uh, uh, we're working on those provisions as we speak. But the fact of the matter is that right to cure is something that would be key to, to most consumers. So that 30 to 90-day window is kind of in play right now. That, that is, and I'm, I'm hoping to see that we will expand the notice provision in this state. The banking industry you alluded to just a moment ago, uh, have they been working with you on this or are they kind of holding it at arm's length on this? I, I will tell you, Scott, this has been a five-year uh, uh, odyssey uh, of us working on this law. Very, uh, I'm very happy to say that uh, our, our bill does indeed have bipartisan support. The chair of the committee uh, that this bill was reviewed in uh, is a co-sponsor of the bill. Uh, we've got uh, members uh, from the banking industry that sat down and we really tr fashioned out a, a, a solution that would not be harmful to the industry, but certainly would provide consumers with much needed protection. Where does the timetable stand now on, on the bill? What's next for it? Well, I will tell you, we, we got out of the session on crossover day perhaps about an hour earlier than I would have hoped. Uh, however, all is certainly not lost. Uh, we have uh, several options. We can attach this to a, a bill that is coming from the Senate uh, that addresses the same code section. We have a special session coming up that we uh, perhaps can see if we can get it added to the agenda there. And certainly, this is just a first year of a two-year session, and it would be first out of the gate in any event uh, come next January. And the special session will be about redistricting this summer. That'd that be is the correct. Headline. That is correct. Are you hearing from local governments, Representative Mitchell, who rely on property tax revenue to do something to keep the, the, the bottom from falling out of their tax digest? Absolutely, and I think that's why we have every entity coming to the table. The fact of the matter, one of the reasons why this country, Georgia, the counties and the cities are in the economic crisis that, that we find ourselves in is because of the, the housing market has, has bottomed out. Mm -hmm. We can no longer rely on the tax revenue that the housing market has normally generated in good times. And so with the, the, the bottoming out of real estate, which we can't certainly stabilize until we abate this foreclosure crisis, come the problems that we find local governments have. We'll have to leave it right there. We'll watch what happens. Thanks for bringing us up to date on it tonight. Thanks for having We're me.
great seeing you. And coming up on, uh, tomorrow on Primetime Lawmakers, we'll continue our leadership interview series with House Majority Leader Larry O'Neill, plus in-depth analysis on important legislative issues and the latest Capitol News tomorrow night at 7. See a repeat of this broadcast uh, tomorrow morning at 5.30 right here. Now coming up next, Georgia Traveler. Tonight's episode, Peach State Panache. Join David, Kat, and Ricky for Georgia's premier travel series. Georgia Traveler is next on GPB. That's our broadcast for this 31st legislative day of the 2011 session. I'm Scott Slade for Wandy Lawson. Have a great night. This is a GPB original production.